Well, hey, everyone. So glad that you're joining us today. Uh, Pastor Mike here at The Core. And today I'm just so, so grateful for whoever Jesus chose to invent technology. <laughs> I know so many of you are at home right now. You're watching online, uh, connecting with God, gathered with family, friends. And I'm so grateful that as a church family, we can connect in this way. Now, if you're watching on Time of Grace right now, what you might not know about our ministry is that we film these messages pretty far in advance. Uh, we need time to edit things, distribute them to our ministry partners. Uh, to be really honest, we need to cut it down so it fits in our allotted TV time slot. So what you might not know right now where you're sitting is that I'm filming this message right in the middle of the craziness of the coronavirus. Yeah, you remember that? <laughs> I hope if you're watching this on TV, Corona is way, way part of the past, just a, a distant memory, which is kind of a challenge for us. Uh, I want to speak to those of you who are watching on TV, but I also want to address our church family who's living in the midst of this. And so here's my deal with you. Uh, in today's message, I'm not going to dive deep into the coronavirus itself. I know a whole bunch of you are dealing with worry and with anxiety and with fear, and you, you really need encouragement from God. So here's what I can offer. If you jump after this message to 922church.com or timeofgrace.org, you're going to find a bunch of great resources to help you fight against that fear. Uh, we have video devotions, written devotions, Bible reading plans, all sorts of stuff to help you tackle that to live with joy and peace and hope. But today, uh, just so I can speak to everyone who's listening, I want to talk to you about Jesus. Because Jesus is always relevant, right? <laughs> so here's the question I want us to wrestle with today. As Christians, are we honest with people when it comes to Jesus? Like, when you have a friend who's kind of interested in your spiritual life, or maybe they want to go with you to church, or when someone shows up here at the core or reaches out to Time of Grace and wants to learn more about Jesus, are you, am I, honest? Are we totally upfront with people about what this is, how it works, and how hard it can be? When I think about Honest Christians, uh, one of my all-time favorite videos comes to mind. It's called The Honest Preacher. <laughs> Have you seen the video before? Uh, if not, I want to show it to you today. So take a look. Today's reading comes from the book of Proverbs. If I may digress for a moment from my prepared message, I mean it when I say to you, You guys! Sometimes you're bad! Don't be jerks! You're supposed to be good! I'm in my office every day and somebody comes in and they're like, Hey, whoops! My don't! Come on. Dan, what is your deal? If anybody doesn't know, Dan is the worst. I took a vow to not say who was the worst, but it's Dan. You guys are making me look bad in front of God. What's that? Oh, look, it's Jesus. And he said, Stop it! The word of the Lord. <laughs> I told you. Stop it! Isn't that so good? Stop it! <laughs> You're making me look bad in front of God. Now, as a pastor, as a preacher, I love that video because it, it is just so brutally honest. Like, we don't say those things to people, even if we think them up here. That is a truly honest preacher. But here's my question. Um, are, are we honest as Christians? 
Now, don't worry, I'm not going to say anyone is the worst <laughs> here today, but w- when someone's interested in Jesus, are we upfront with them? And I think my answer to that question, my honest answer, is not entirely. If you've ever heard me talk about Christianity before or about our church's ministry, you might have heard me say something like this. I'm so glad that you're here. And I want you to keep coming back. And keep watching on TV, watching online, coming to church. Because the more you gather around the words and the promises of Jesus, the more peace you're going to have in your heart. So if you want peace, keep gathering. Hear how Jesus loves you and he's with you, that God is right here. He's got this. He forgives every single sin. His mercy is new every single morning. And if you want more joy in your spiritual life, then open up the Bible, not just Sunday after Sunday, but day after day after day and read about the amazing Jesus who says he is your big brother, your perfect savior, your ultimate sacrifice. And the more you realize the the power and the presence of God, you're just going to have this joy like you've never had before, a joy that can endure through every season of life. And if you want self-control in your life, if you drink too much or you get angry too quickly, then get a group. Let us help you connect with other Christians who can know you and pray for you, they can encourage you, they can hold you accountable, and best of all, they can bring you to the cross of Jesus when you fall and fail. I mean, you've heard me say stuff like that, right? Get these roots, plant them deep in Jesus, and you will enjoy the fruit of joy and peace and love and self-control. Now, is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's not some church pitch that that we give to get people to fill these seats. That is absolutely the biblical path of Christianity. That's the promise of the blessing of God. But that's not the whole truth. In fact, when people would show up and want to follow Jesus, when the people who had gathered in the crowds were ready to check a box and make a commitment, Jesus didn't just tell them, about the love and the peace and the joy, he also told them about something else. He didn't put it in the fine print. He told it to them right up front. Jesus was the ultimate honest preacher. And today I want to share with you his words. Now I want to warn you up front, what Jesus is about to say is the true cost of Christianity. And it will cost way more of you than maybe you ever imagined. Or a better way to say it, it it might require way less of you than you ever imagined. But here's what else I can promise. If you're with Jesus and follow him, no matter what the cost is, he is worthy and he's worth it because he offers you the the best blessings in all of the universe. So today we're going to open our Bibles. Uh, We're going to dig into Matthew chapter 8 and we're going to see two conversations that Jesus had with two people who are ready to take that next step. We're going to learn the cost from Jesus, but he's going to honestly tell us the incredible blessing of being with him. So if you have a Bible with you at home or you want to just follow along here on your screen, uh, let's jump in in Matthew chapter 8 where we find these words. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now those are amazing words. You know, what better opportunity could Jesus have to build his church than this? Let me tell you why. Because verse 19 says that a teacher of the law came to Jesus. The teachers of the law were kind of like the Bible scholars of Jesus' day. Uh, They were the dudes with many leather-bound books, if books had existed back then, many leather-bound scrolls. Uh, These were the guys who could just like quote the book of Habakkuk from memory. And yet this guy wants to follow Jesus. He's smart, he's intelligent, he's committed to spiritual things, 
Uh, even though he's a teacher, he calls Jesus his teacher in this verse. He doesn't demand, Jesus, you follow me. He says, Jesus, I'll follow you. It's a great start. What's even better is that this is the only guy in the entire group who says it. I did a little research this week on the phrase, teachers of the law, and I learned that that phrase shows up 63 different times in the New Testament. And this is the only time it's good. There's one time where a teacher of the law kind of admits to Jesus that he makes a decent point in a biblical argument. But all of the other times, all the other 61 times, do you know what the teachers of the law do? They try to trap Jesus and trick Jesus. They plot and plan and push back against Jesus. The teachers of the law, by name, are the guys who help put him on the cross. All of them, except this guy. When all the other teachers took a step back and crossed their arms, this guy is the only one who took a step forward to follow Jesus. He turned his back on the popularity and acceptance of his friends. He didn't need to be like all of his other colleagues and co-workers. This guy said, Jesus, even if none of them do, I will follow you. And if that weren't good enough, <laughs> did you hear this word? Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. That is the perfect word. Jesus, wherever. You want to go to Galilee? You want to go through Samaria? Judea, Jerusalem, Jesus, wherever. You're the Lord. You take the lead. I'm just here to follow you wherever you go. Now, come on. That, that is as good as it gets. So what would you have said to this guy? And imagine if some celebrity showed up at our church and he said, I'm in. <laughs> what if someone famous, some YouTube star, the Jonas Brothers, Jojo Siwa, Justin Bieber, Kanye himself, Aaron Rodgers, your favorite athlete, what if they reached out to you and said, hey, uh, tell me about Jesus because I'm all in. What if some billionaire, some philanthropist showed up to your ministry and said, you tell me what to do, you tell me how much to give, you tell me where to serve, wherever Jesus wants to take me, I'm in. What would you say to a person like that? <laughs> Here's what I'd say. I'd look around at the crowds and I would say, shh. Did you hear that? Sir, could you say that again? Did you hear that? Wherever. This guy will follow Jesus wherever. That, ladies and gentlemen, that is faith. That is what God himself is looking for. That, that's what I'd say. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus said. Now check out his response in verse 20. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus says to this guy, Do you really want to follow me? Sir, today the foxes will snuggle up in their little den, safe and sound, and they will fall asleep. The birds of the air will nestle up in their high nests, far from danger, and they'll fall asleep. Sir, do you know where I'm going to sleep today? In a boat. Read Matthew chapter 8. That actually happens. Jesus has no pillow, no mattress, no familiar home. He's going to fall asleep exhausted from an exhausting day of work in a wet boat. A hard brown plank will be his pillow. Surrounded by 12 exhausted, probably stinky men. And he's honest with this guy. He says, you really want to follow me? 
What if it costs you? What if you have to give up your comfort, your safety? What if it's dangerous? What if you have to lose the entire life you used to know? Jesus' response actually makes me think of an experience I just had in Israel. A couple weeks ago, I was in the city of Jerusalem and I had this really romantic idea that I was going to get up and I was going to run up the Mount of Olives just as the sun was rising and see the bright light shining on the city where my Savior lived and died and rose for me. So I looked it up on Google Maps and I found out that from my hotel on the west side of the city, down past the Temple Mount and up to the top of the Mount of Olives was only about a two-mile run. So there and back, four miles, I run quite a bit, not a big deal. Uh, But do you know what happens? It was way, way, way harder than I ever thought it would be. Before I show you a picture, uh, let me explain something to you. Uh, My wife and I were considering running the San Francisco Half Marathon on an upcoming vacation. But we Googled it and we found out that the marathon was way harder than we anticipated. In the half marathon, those 13.1 miles, the elevation climb in San Francisco was 792 feet. (laughs) 792 feet up (laughs) and 13 miles wide. And my wife and I looked at each other and we said, Maybe not. (laughs) I mean, this is our vacation. Oh my goodness, we want to walk the day after the race. And so we decided to not sign up for 13 miles because it was 792 feet tall. Well, back to Jerusalem. Do you want to know what I found out? As I was running up and down and up and down the hills of that city, let me show you a picture. In 4.4 miles, This is what happened. You see that? 997 feet of elevation gain. (laughs) I ran a a 10-minute mile. That's crazy different than what I normally run. And honestly, that's not accurate because I pushed pause because I was not running this race. I was not walking this race. I mean, I was stopping and gasping and almost dying. The city of Jerusalem was one like what, one-third the distance of a half marathon, but it was 25% higher in elevation climb. It was hard. I had this romantic idea of life in Israel, but it turned out to be way harder than I expected. And I think that's what Jesus is honestly telling us. He wants us to walk with him, to run the race of the Christian faith, but he wants to dispel any romantic notion we have of what exactly that's going to be like. He wants us to know this is not a walk in the park. Christianity is not like walking the dog on a freshly paved suburban bike trail. No, it's kind of like life in Israel. It's kind of like running up the hills of Jerusalem. It's way harder than you expect. So what exactly is Jesus trying to tell us. What specifically is the hard part of following him, of being a Christian and staying a Christian in this life? If you know much about the basics of Christianity, you realize that that it's not like we pay money to be a Christian. It's a free gift to be saved and have eternal life through the cross of Jesus. And it's not like you have to pay God with all these good works. You know, everyone is a step up the mountain until you get to see God. Seeing the face of God is a gift that comes through faith in Jesus. It's by grace and it's not from us. So if that's not the cost, what exactly is it? What does Jesus want us to know up front as we start to follow him? Well, that's what Jesus explains in conversation number two. Apparently, while the teacher of the law thinks about Jesus' sobering words, another guy comes forward. And in the second conversation, Jesus tells this guy exactly the true, honest nature, the cost of Christianity. So let's jump back to Matthew chapter 8. 
Here's what we follow, find in verse 21. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Well, that's a pretty good start, isn't it? This guy's called the disciple. Uh, in Greek, a disciple is a learner or a follower. That's a good humble start. And he even calls Jesus not just teacher. Here he calls him Lord. That means, Jesus, you're the master. You get the last word. I'm humbly here to follow you. So this is a great start, right? And the only thing the guy wants to do is to first go bury the father that he loves. But that's not good enough for Jesus. Because this guy in verse 21 uses a word that offends God more than any other. It's the five-letter F word. Did you catch it? F-I-R-S-T. First. Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus won't have it. Here's his response in verse 22. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Okay, can I take a really quick tangent? This is a hard verse to interpret for a whole bunch of reasons. First, most Bible scholars think that based on Jesus' answer, this guy's father probably isn't dead just yet. He probably had an old, elderly, aging father and he wanted time to take care of that before he followed Jesus. So, you know, Jesus, give me a few weeks, a few months, maybe a few years, but then, then I'm all with you. And Jesus' answer is kind of confusing too. Let the dead bury their own dead. Obviously, physically dead people can't bury anyone else. So what he seems to be saying is let those who are spiritually dead, those who don't care about following me, take care of the priorities of this world. I'm not positive of that interpretation, but, but I do know this. The guy said to Jesus, Jesus, I'll follow you, but first. And Jesus replied to him, no, no, no. First, follow If I was going to summarize Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 8, it would be with those two words. In fact, if you're taking notes at home, I'd, I'd love for you to write this down. That with Jesus, you must first follow. The true cost of Christianity is what has to come first. That's what Jesus wanted both those men to know. And it's what he wants you to know today too. Yeah, maybe I could illustrate it like this. Uh, let's imagine that these books that I have here represent the different parts of your life. Uh, this Bible represents Jesus. Uh, this book here is about leadership, so maybe this could represent your job. Yeah, this one is about uh, finances, so this could represent your budget. Uh, this one is a manual for writers. This could represent your education, college, uh, grad school. And this one's called Love and Respect. Let's think about dating, marriage, family, kids. Now, Jesus in the Bible is very clear that he is for all of these things. He wants you to study hard, work hard, use money wisely. Uh, marriage can be a wonderful gift. Have, having kids, grandkids is amazing. But what Jesus is, is saying is when you have to choose what comes first, well then, what comes first with you? When there's not enough time or money or energy to do all of these things, where does he fit into the stack? Is he somewhere in the middle? Are we pretty much in favor for him except there's this one thing that we just need to do first? Do we have to tackle all the other responsibilities of life and, and then if there's a little bit of time or money left over, then Jesus, I'll follow you? Jesus is saying in these verses that you can have all these things in your life but Christians are called to do this to follow first. Now let me give you a few concrete examples of what this means. 
Um, let's talk about your time. God, because he is an amazing God, he wants to spend time with you. He wants you to connect with his word through live streams and church services, through prayer and Bible studies at home. He wants to hear your voice as you speak to him in prayer and he wants to speak back to you in his holy, precious word. But that takes time. And honestly, there's not enough time to do everything in this life. So if you would say to Jesus, you know, I want to do that, Jesus. I I really want to grow deeper in my faith with you. But first, you know, first I got to get through this crazy season at work. Or first, there's basketball, just tournaments every weekend. But once that's over, then, Jesus, oh, Jesus, I have 18 credits and there's just no time, so I'll I'll get to that, but it's going to take a year or two. Well, the kids are little, Jesus. We we just don't, you know, have time. We we don't have energy. What would Jesus say to that? Let the dead bury their own dead. You? 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 Follow me first. Or think about our energy. Jesus calls us to love people. And loving real people with real personalities, real flaws, and real issues, it takes energy. And we're very tempted to say, well, you know, Jesus, I'll I'll love some people, but, you know, she just drains me of energy And those people at church, I don't know, they're kind of tough to love. And, you know, I'd love to join a group and really invest in people, but I I want to feel fed. I want to get something out of it. And if I don't, you know, maybe I'm going to find different people. And and Jesus would say, different people? This isn't middle school. This is Christianity. You, you let all of that go and you first follow me. Or, as long as we're being honest, um, what about money? Jesus is in the business of giving generously. He loves it when his church takes care of people. When we love one another in dollars and cents kind of ways. Read the Bible. He has a great heart for the needy, the poor, the oppressed. But so often, do you know what we do? Me too, Jesus. But first, first I have this budget. And first I want to take the kids to Disney. First I want to retire at this age. First there are my investments. First my boat my vacation home, my my two cars, my 2,000 square feet. And Jesus says, Disney? (laughs) Whoever said this was Disney? No, first, you give. First, you serve. If there's some left over, then do that. God bless you. But first, You follow me. Now that is honest. The other day, I I went on a run with my uh, with my daughters, and uh, they were on their bikes, and I was running, and I asked my youngest daughter, "Sweetie, do, do you think your dad is honest with people at church? Do you think when people come to our church?" Daddy really tells them what it's like to be a Christian. And my little girl said, kind of. But Daddy, you don't want to scare them away. And so I told her about Jesus in Matthew 8. And I said, sweetie, do you think Jesus should start acting more like Daddy? Or Daddy should start acting more like Jesus. Hmm. You know, I I can't see through the other side of this lens. I can't read the expression on your face, but I I have a hunch I know what it is. 
first follow. That's a big cost. That would change our priorities. That, that would change our lives. That would hurt harder than the hills of Jerusalem. But if you're not smiling right now, you miss something. Because I said the big idea for today is first follow. Now maybe you got caught up on the word first and what it would mean for your life, but please, 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 please do not miss the next word. Follow. When Jesus said to those men, first, follow me, he said, follow me. And he says the same thing to us today. Yeah, I mean, Jesus is God. He is completely fine without us. He's not lonely and depressed, quarantined and isolated up in heaven. He's, he's God. He satisfies himself by his own glory. And yet, what does he say to you, to me, to little people like us? Follow me. He wants us to be with him. He wants to walk with us through every step of life, through the craziness of a virus, through the pressure of depression, through the hard years of growing old. Every step of the way, he wants to make sure that we're never alone, that we're with him. Jesus, when he invites you, follow me, he wants to take your hand and lead you to green pastures and to quiet waters. He wants to take you to a place where you know that God is with you, that God is in you, that God is for you. He wants to guide you into the presence of our Heavenly Father where you can see his face shining upon you and it gives you peace. <laughs> Jesus wants you to lead you to a well of bottomless mercy and forgiveness and grace. Yes, it will cost you your old priorities, but what do we get when we follow Jesus? Jesus. We get to have him with us always. It, it kind of reminds me of Mount Arbel. A few weeks ago when I was in Israel, <clears throat> we were trying to shoot a few devotions and we, by random chance, stumbled upon a parking lot which was connected to a path. Now, let me show you a picture of it. There was this stone path that led into this valley and what we didn't know at the time is that this path was the entrance to one of Israel's most beautiful national parks. And the path wound up, 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 up Mount Arbel on the western coast of the Sea of Galilee. And as we followed that path, uh, honestly, it was costly. <laughs> Actually, let me show you the next picture. It was so costly, I was sweating and gasping and dying. I unbuttoned my shirt because it was way harder than I thought it was going to be. There were some times where the rocks were shifty. There were literally cliffs that would have plunged me to my death. And a whole bunch of times, the cows who were grazing on Mount Arbel had left, had left some presents <laughs> right in the middle of the walking path. So it was hard. But can I tell you something? it was probably the best part of the entire trip. Every time I stopped on that path and I looked around, I saw the, the beauty of Galilee. The sun was setting to the west. The Sea of Galilee was just around the corner to the east. The green grass, the plunging valleys, the blue sky. I, I would pull up my phone and try to capture the beauty. And the longer I went, the higher I climbed, the more beautiful it got until I finally got to the top. Let me show you a picture of that. At the top of Mount Arbel, you, you turn around the cliff face and you see the sea. The shore of the Sea of Galilee where our Savior lived and worked and taught and healed and forgave and saved. And when I stood there, there were not words to capture the joy of that moment. And that experience reminded me of what it is to be a Christian. You know, one day we're going to get to the top. By the grace of Jesus, we are going to see the, the full view of our Father's face in heaven and there will not be words for that. 
But even now, even on the path as we follow Jesus, when we stop and think about who we are, children of God, about what we have, a divine plan for our lives, about what is ours, forgiveness for every sin, mercy for our pride, patience with our weakness. We have a God who walks with us every step of the way. He needs nothing and yet he gives everything. He gives himself. And so, yes, first is a great cost. But first follow is the greatest reward. In one of his stories, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure in a field and with joy he gives up everything he has to purchase that field. It's exactly what Jesus is teaching. (laughs) You have to give up all the priorities of the past. Everything has to look different but when you follow Jesus, you get a treasure. You get the Father and the Spirit and eternal life with all three and joy that will never end. Do you know how I know that that's true? Because Jesus didn't just count the cost. He paid the price. The Son of God gave up the joys of heaven for an earth where he had no place to lay his head. And with his own two feet, he climbed the hills of Judea and Jerusalem, Galilee, and then finally, Golgotha. The cross would cost Jesus his comfort, his safety, and even his very life. But you know why he did it? To put the Father first. So that you and I could be first on the Father's mind. So friends, brothers and sisters, wherever you are, whenever you are watching, remember this. Jesus will cost you everything and he will give you back so much more. That's the cost and the reward of following him. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, some of us know already how hard it is to put you first. Our lives in so many instances would be so much easier if we didn't have to reorder them and repent of our sins. And yet every one of us who is a Christian knows that it is absolutely worth it. To know at the end of every day you are there. To know that despite all of our weakness and failures that we are cleansed and washed, we are beautiful, we are yours. And so we're so grateful for you today, Jesus. Thank you for paying the price. Thank you for counting the cost and carrying your cross. Thank you that even if we lose everything, we have to die. In you, we will find a life that never ends. We love you. We praise you. And we commit today with your help to follow you first. We ask of Jesus in your beautiful name. Amen. Now, 92 Church family, uh, join with me as we join in the words that our Savior Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts this timeless and beautiful blessing from our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. And all God's people at home said, Amen.